The year was 1993, and I was a college student home on summer break looking for adventure. I had spent the past three months cooped up in the campus library cramming for finals, and now that I had free time, I was itching to get outside and enjoy nature. Growing up in the suburbs, I never had many chances to really connect with the wilderness. After discussing options with some friends, I decided to go on a solo hiking trip out west where I could immerse myself in beautiful, untamed country. Though my parents were worried about me hiking alone, I reassured them I would be safe and stick to marked trails. I had my sights set on Washington State and the rugged Cascade Mountains after hearing they offered some of the most spectacular hiking in America. At 22 years old, I had backpacked before in the Appalachians. But the idea of pitting myself against the grand scale of the Pacific Northwest wilderness excited me. I wanted to push my limits and endurance while enjoying alpine meadows, deep forests, and panoramic vistas. I had only seen on postcards. My planning started months in advance as I pored over topographic maps of the Cascades region and read trail guides. I decided June would be the perfect time to go after the snow melted and before the crowds arrived in summer. I packed my trekking gear, first aid kit, and freeze-dried food for the journey west. After several long days of driving, I arrived in a small town situated right near the foothills of the North Cascades. The town was little more than a main street, a few restaurants and shops, and a basic motel where I checked in for the night. Beyond the town limits, the wilderness began, craggy, snow-dusted peaks stretching off into the distance. That night I could barely sleep, tossing with excitement about the hike ahead. At dawn, I loaded up my reliable Subaru station wagon and hit the road toward the mountains. I reached the trailhead by mid-morning, the alpine air clean and crisp. Slipping on my pack stuffed with gear and supplies, I took a deep breath, gazing up at the granite cliffs ahead. I was ready for this adventure. The first couple days of hiking were moderate but breathtakingly beautiful. I followed marked trails, passing cascading waterfalls that rainbowed in the sunlight. Thick forests of pine and fir towered like cathedrals, and I breathed deep the scent of earth and moss. At night I pitched my tent at established campsites, unwinding sore muscles next to a crackling fire as owls hooted in the darkness beyond. By day three, I branched off onto less popular trails, wanting to experience the backcountry wildness. The only souls I encountered were the occasional deer, badger, marmot, or other wildlife. My muscles burned and ached climbing steep inclines and fording cold mountain streams. But the payoff was endless ridgeline vistas looking out over the rumpled landscape unfolding for miles. The feeling of being a tiny speck amid such epic grandeur was powerful. My worries and burdens of everyday life sloughed away mile by mile. I was humbled by the ancient forces that sculpted this land, carving valleys and raising peaks. At night, watching meteor showers streak overhead, I'd never felt more connected to nature. After nearly two weeks of hiking, I was approaching the high alpine region. The air grew thinner and the views more breathtaking with each step. Late one afternoon, I climbed a switchback ridge trail that left me winded. Cresting the top, an unbelievable sight stretched before me. A pristine alpine meadow sprawled, dotted with wildflowers, fiery Indian paintbrush, sunbursts of columbine, and purple lupine nodding in the breeze. Snow-capped monoliths loomed in the distance like silent sentinels rimming this hidden valley. Through the middle burbled a crystalline river, catching the dipping sun in glints of gold. Enraptured by the scene, I quickly set up camp right there rather than lose a minute of daylight to enjoy it. I set up my tent, built a fire ring with nearby stones, and cooked a freeze-dried dinner as the setting sun cast a pink glow. This was the kind of raw, untouched beauty I had longed for. As darkness fell, I layered up against the chill and reclined on a flat rock, gazing up at the sea of stars above. Exhausted from the long day's hike, I curled up in my sleeping bag soon after stargazing, the chill night air seeping through the nylon tent. 
but I slept deeply and soundly in the alpine stillness, only awakened once by the eerie hoot of an owl piercing the night. Morning arrived slowly, the first glow of dawn barely penetrating the depths of the valley. I emerged from my tent shivering, the meadow grass crunchy with frost. Taking my camp stove and pan down to the riverbank, I boiled water for instant coffee as I watched the sunlight creep down the rocky crags, slowly bringing warmth back to the valley. Sipping the hot coffee, I planned my route for the day, consulting my maps. I decided to follow the river upstream as far as possible, deeper into the backcountry. The lure of uncharted terrain pulled at me. My pack now felt featherlight after two weeks of conditioning my muscles and shedding any unnecessary weight. I was ready to cover some serious miles. After breakfast, I went about breaking down camp and repacking my gear with the efficiency of routine. Tent stakes and guy lines coiled neatly, sleeping bag compressed into its sack, clothes and food packed strategically. I stamped out the remains of my fire and scattered the ashes. Slinging on my pack, I took a last sweeping view of the meadow. Then I headed off, following the meandering course of the river. The first miles were easy going, the valley bottom relatively flat and grassy. But soon the walls closed in as I entered a narrow gorge. The terrain turned rockier, sometimes necessitating boulder hopping or bushwhacking through thickets choking the shoreline. When the underbrush became impassable, I simply waded through the frigid knee-deep water. I continued at a brisk pace with only occasional breaks to sip water and re-energize with handfuls of trail mix. My legs had grown lean and toned after days of mountain trekking, propelling me forward. Thoughts of graduate school, career, and other future obligations back home couldn't have felt farther away out here. By early afternoon, the gorge opened up into another valley, not as spectacular as yesterday's flowered meadow, but still breathtaking. Golden light filtered through the trees, dappling the forest floor. Across the valley, I could see where the river emerged from between two imposing peaks. I felt drawn there, tempted to see this river's source, but I knew it was too late in the day to attempt summiting those slopes. Reluctantly, I decided to call it a day. Spotting a clearing on the riverside, I chose a flat patch of grass sheltered by pines to make camp. The familiar tasks soothed me as I gathered kindling and cleared the ground for my tent. Soon I had a modest fire crackling and was savoring another meal of instant rice and beans as the valley darkened. The exertion of the day's hike caught up with me. I journaled briefly by firelight, chronicling the day's sights. As fatigue set in, I doused the fire until only glowing embers remained. Crawling into my tent, I was lulled to sleep by the soft roar of the river nearby. Tomorrow, I would venture into those peaks to find the river's source. But that night, I dreamt only of the open trail ahead, carrying me deeper into the wild unknown. Where the path would lead, I couldn't say but some innate pull told me to keep following it, step by step, mile by mile. I awoke with the first light of dawn. Despite the long day yesterday and a restful sleep, my legs felt restless and eager to get back on the trail. I wolfed down a breakfast of oatmeal and dried fruit, chasing it with bitter instant coffee. The familiar routine of breaking camp invigorated me as I efficiently packed up my gear. Soon I was back on the path, picking my way along the river's edge. My pace was brisk, breathing deep in the crisp morning air scented with pine resin. The towering peaks drew steadily nearer as I hiked. Surrounding trees gradually gave way to steep rocky slopes filled with boulders and scrubby brush. I continued hiking until midday when I came across a curious sight. There, among a collection of cedar trees, sat a dilapidated structure that appeared to be an old fire lookout tower. I approached cautiously through the underbrush for a better look. The tower stood two stories tall, boards gray and weathered. Glass was missing from the observation deck windows, and the entire thing listed slightly to one side. 
I glanced at my topographic map but saw no indication of any structures out here. When was it built and by whom? And why place a watchtower out here miles from the nearest road or town? My innate curiosity compelled me to take a closer look and find out more. Circling the base, I found the metal rungs of a fixed ladder still intact, leading up to the lower observation deck. Though rickety with age, the ladder seemed stable enough still to support my weight. I decided to climb up to get a view of the surrounding landscape from above. Maybe I'd spot some other remnants or ruins in the area. Setting my pack down, I cautiously tested my weight on the first few rungs. They held firm, with only a bit of creaking. I began making my way up the ladder slowly, keeping a firm grip. I imagined the long-ago fire spotters scrambling up nimbly on their daily watch. As I ascended past the lower deck, getting higher above the trees, I felt the old familiar thrill of being up high with a bird's eye vantage. But nearing the top, I started to feel strange, almost watched. The surrounding forest seemed too quiet and still. I shook off the ominous feeling, chalking it up to the tower's dilapidated state. Pulling myself up the last few rungs, I hoisted myself gingerly onto the upper observation deck. Up here, the full extent of the tower's disrepair became clear. The wooden floorboards were cracked and crumbling, with areas completely rotted through. Shattered glass littered the corner, remnants of the panoramic windows. Stepping carefully to avoid weak spots, I walked the perimeter of the deck. The sweeping views of craggy ridges and dense forest now opened up just as I had hoped. But as I peered closer at the tower itself, details emerged that filled me with growing unease. Strange stains that looked disturbingly like old dried blood splattered the inner walls, and gouged into the wooden planks were numerous deep scratches and gashes. The chaotic claw marks looked far too aggressive to be from any animal. My mind raced with what could have caused such violent and eerie damage. I shuddered as I imagined some horrific scene of desperation and carnage that must have played out here long ago. As much as the mystery piqued my curiosity, a powerful instinct told me to get out of there. The watchtower that had seemed merely abandoned now felt ominous, almost foreboding. The shadows inside seemed to hold some deeper darkness. I weighed whether to turn back, but the explorer in me hungered to unravel the clues and better understand what had happened in this lonely tower. I still had sunlight left to keep looking around. Ignoring my unease, I resolved to stay a little longer and see what else I could discover. I peered closer at the gashes. Kneeling down, I examined more closely the brownish stains, smelling the unmistakable iron scent of old blood. What terrified struggle had led to such carnage? As I studied the claw marks, I convinced myself some wild animal must be to blame, perhaps a rogue grizzly. There was surely some rational explanation behind it all. But the isolated watchtower still felt heavy with a lingering darkness. The shadows seemed to be growing longer, though it was only mid-afternoon. Despite my desire for answers, I finally had to admit it was time to head back down before I lost daylight. I wasn't thrilled about climbing down the ladder in darkness. Lingering dread compelled me towards the hatch. Stepping gingerly around broken glass and debris, I walked the perimeter of the deck. Through the shattered windows, an impressive panorama opened up of the surrounding forested valley. Steep, rugged ridges extended to the horizon, topped by rocky outcroppings. The afternoon sun cast long shadows between the trees below. I gazed out at the endless expanse, happy to have reached this bird's-eye vantage point. But this far from civilization, a sense of isolation weighed on me. The only sounds were the wind gusting through the trees and the lonely cries of hawks circling above. I was about to turn back toward the ladder when a sudden noise from the forest below froze me in my tracks. A deep, guttural growl rumbled up from the trees, echoing around the valley walls. The sound seemed to vibrate through my core, setting my heart racing. Gripping the window frame for balance, I desperately scanned the trees below, searching for the source. 
My eyes landed on a dark shape lurching among the shadows under the firs. It moved with a hulking, deliberate gait, nothing like a bear or mountain lion. Details were obscured by brush and distance, but the figure appeared massive and almost humanoid, walking upright on two legs. Paralyzing terror seized me as I watched it approach the base of the tower. This was no ordinary forest creature. It began to climb the tower's weathered ladder toward me. I stood frozen in fear and disbelief at the nightmarish scene unfolding. The creature's limb proportions were human-like, yet its movements were utterly inhuman. Soon it would reach me, and I was completely exposed here on the open deck with nowhere to run or hide. With my heart thundering in my ears, I watched helplessly as it drew nearer. The wood framing creaked under its weight as if it could rip the tower apart. I teetered on the edge of outright hysteria and had to stifle an urge to scream. But some primal part of me knew that could provoke the thing to attack faster. Only halfway up the ladder, and already the creature's stench reached me, an awful mix of mud and decaying flesh. I gagged at the putrid smell, eyes watering. Still, my muscles refused to respond, refusing to flee in blind panic. I stood rooted in place. The creature had now almost reached the lower observation deck, just ten feet below me. I could hear its rattling breaths along with the scrape of claws on wood. Details of its appearance began coming into focus through the haze of dread. Skin gray and rough like moldy bark. A muscular frame that seemed ready to burst through its filthy, tattered clothing. But its face was what seared into my mind. A hairless, twisted caricature of a human face with sightless white orbs for eyes and a mouth of jagged yellowing teeth. Those milky, unseeing eyes somehow conveyed a sinister intelligence, an insatiable hunger. My sanity strained to process what I was witnessing. But the putrid smell rooted me in the present. There would be no escape. I glimpsed the gnarled claws gouging into the wood of the final rung as it heaved itself onto the deck. There was nowhere left to run. Frantically, I scanned the deck for some means of escape, some route to evade the horror now cornering me. But the tower platform offered nowhere to hide from the humanoid beast. Rotted boards, broken glass, and a few feeble railings were my only surroundings. Escape would mean getting past the creature blocking my path to the ladder. I looked at the beast towering before me, well over seven feet tall. Powerful muscles rippled under its filthy skin. Even if I managed to dodge its gnarled grasp, its immense stride could easily catch me on the confined deck before I reached the hatch. My mind raced through hopeless scenarios of fighting back or pleading for mercy from a force clearly devoid of it. The creature seemed to be watching me with sinister patience, stopping its approach to let me struggle with futility. It was toying with me, I realized, relishing in my desperation. Slowly it began pacing the perimeter of the deck, between me and the only exit. I turned in a cautious circle, tracking it. A deep rumbling chuckle emanated from its cavernous chest as it herded me toward the broken window. Step by step, it was backing me toward a lethal plummet. Inching backward, I frantically racked my mind for options. Trying to slip past and flee down the ladder would be suicide. The creature could easily grab me or knock me off the platform as I passed. I might be able to struggle briefly, but this beast could tear me apart limb from limb once it got hold of me. My only chance of escape, I saw with gut-wrenching clarity, was to jump from this towering height. But looking out at the forest floor forty feet below, I faltered. Surviving the fall seemed nearly as impossible as surviving the monster's attack. Either option would likely end with me dead or crippled at the base of the tower. I hesitated at the precipice, looking back at the creature as it drew within mere feet, toying with me like a cat with a cornered mouse. Up close, its twisted features and foul stench nearly made me wretch in fear. I closed my eyes, bracing myself. As it reached for me, I leaped over the railing into the open air. For a few dizzying seconds, I was weightless, the wind roaring in my ears. 
I had a brief glimpse of branches rushing upward before colliding brutally with the rocky earth. Searing pain shot through my left leg and hip as I slammed down hard and tumbled over roots and underbrush. Only adrenaline allowed me to scramble to my feet. My left leg buckled under me when I tried to limp forward. But fueled by terror, I hobbled frantically toward the trees. Behind me, the monster's shrieks of rage rang out as it thundered back down the tower ladder. I made it just to the tree line before my leg gave out and I collapsed. Crawling now on elbows and one knee, I somehow kept dragging myself forward, weaving between the pines for cover. The creature's enraged roars shook the forest as it closed in behind me. Sheer desperation drove me to keep moving. I had to get as far from the watchtower as possible before the monster recaptured my scent. Branches tore at my clothes and skin, but I barely felt the cuts and scratches. Adrenaline allowed me to scramble a few more feet and disappear into the underbrush before everything went dark. When I came to, the forest was silent. My legs still blazed with pain, but the scream of panic driving me on was gone. Somehow, I had found cover here. As my wits slowly returned, I dared to hope I might live to see another sunset. But I had to keep moving. Gritting my teeth, I leaned on a branch and staggered deeper into the woods, one step at a time. The creature's enraged roars still rang in my ears, though the forest now appeared empty around me. I must have dragged myself here in a semi-conscious panic before collapsing. But I knew the thing from the tower could return any moment to pick up my trail. I had to move. Gritting my teeth, I pulled myself upright using a tree branch, barely able to put weight on my injured leg. Hobbling and stumbling, I started weaving between the pines as quickly as I could manage. My progress was slow and halting, but I was desperate to get distance from that cursed watchtower and the nightmare creature I had glimpsed there. The terrain was rough, forcing me to scramble over rocks and fallen logs. I used saplings and branches as crutches to keep from falling. The jarring pain that shot through my leg with each step soon had me slick with cold sweat but terror drove me to maintain a frantic, lurching pace. As I half ran, half staggered through the trees, the creature's distant roars reached me. The tower was far behind me now, but the thing had picked up my trail and was pursuing me through the forest. The guttural bellows and crashing branches came from somewhere behind, seemingly growing closer with each passing minute. Panic surged through me, lending strength to my aching muscles and numbed limbs. I no longer felt the cuts and scrapes from the underbrush whipping my arms and face. A singular purpose consumed me, to get as far away as possible from the hellish entity hunting me down. I scrambled on, crashing heedlessly through the understory. But the adrenaline that had fueled my flight soon began wearing off. As terror's spell wore down, my legs started throbbing relentlessly. The simple act of walking now became excruciating as the pain mounted. I could only hobble slowly, weaving and stumbling like a drunkard. Each glancing blow or stubbed toe was blinding agony. Progress slowed to a limping crawl. My clumsy footfalls and gasping breath sounded thunderously loud, betraying my location. Glancing back, I still saw no sign of the creature but its enraged bellows continued at a steady volume, neither gaining nor losing distance. The thing was tracking me unerringly through the winding woods. I knew I had to keep moving or resign myself to being torn limb from limb by that hideous monstrosity. Mustering my last dregs of strength and will, I forced my maimed leg onward. I was running on pure desperation now, ignoring my own suffering. If I could just break the creature's line of sight, I might be able to hide and evade it. The forest floor flew by in a blur of pain and panic. My heart pounded in my ears, drowning out all other sounds. Just when I thought my body could take no more, a distinct cracking of branches came from somewhere behind and to my left. The thing was nearby now, closing in. My time was quickly running out. My leg was on fire, each step was sheer torment but I pushed through the pain, staggering between trees and underbrush. 
The creature sounded terrifyingly close now, its snarls and heavy footfalls closing in through the forest. I risked a panicked glance behind me as I fled. Through the trees I caught the large form barreling toward me, moving with uncanny speed for its massive size. It was only a hundred yards back, smashing through saplings and shrubs. Seeing the thing galvanized my survival instinct. I scrambled on faster, my breath now coming in ragged sobs. Frantically I searched for somewhere, anywhere to hide and break its line of sight. But the woods here offered little cover, just thin trunks and low ferns that would conceal nothing. The creature's panting breaths seemed just behind me as I dashed and wove between the trees. Then, suddenly, I stumbled into a small clearing and saw a massive fallen oak, its trunk hollow and barrel-shaped. I limped to it without hesitation, collapsing to my knees and crawling inside feet first. I pulled my pack in behind me and scooted deeper into the log's sheltering darkness. The space was tight, with room only to lay flat on my back. Outside, I could hear the thing crashing closer until it sounded like it was right on top of me. Holding my breath, I peered through a small hole in the bark, my heart in my throat. Seconds later, I saw the creature's feet stride into view, so close I could have reached out and touched them. The rotten stench preceding it made me gag. The thing stopped mere yards from my hiding spot. It turned in a slow circle, nose raised to the air, inhaling loudly. Good God, it was sniffing me out. I lay paralyzed, praying the earthy, damp rot smell of the log would mask my scent. For endless minutes, the monster paced around the log, so close I could hear the scrape of its claws and deep rumble in its throat. My nerves frayed near the breaking point as I waited. But somehow the thing lost my scent trail. With an enraged howl, it turned and retreated the way it had come, back toward the watchtower. I remained huddled in the cramped log, hardly daring to breathe as the sounds of its passage faded. Only once the forest was silent again did I risk creeping from my hiding spot. My injured leg had stiffened during the tense wait, making it even harder to walk now. But with the creature gone, at least briefly, I had to keep moving. Blinking in the late afternoon sunlight, I continued, ears straining for any sign of pursuit. The creature's frustrated cries still rang out far behind me. It seemed to be following my original trail back toward the tower. But I knew it was only a matter of time before it picked up my path again. I had to make the most of this chance to get away. Ignoring my body's pleas to stop, I pressed on. Each awkward, stumbling step took me farther from that unspeakable evil and brought me closer to survival. As the light faded, I walked from shadow to shadow. The shadows lengthened as afternoon faded into dusk. I had managed to evade the creature, but now found myself stumbling lost and exhausted through the darkening woods. The towering pines and firs closed around me, leaving only faint ribbons of orange sky visible overhead. My leg throbbed relentlessly, making each halting step an ordeal. Gouges and scratches from the underbrush covered my arms and face. Fear and pain left me lightheaded and gasping. But I knew I couldn't stop. To rest even for a moment was to risk the creature catching my scent again. As night fell, the trees became a disorienting black maze. With no moon or stars yet visible, I was engulfed in darkness. I clung desperately to the vague hope I was heading west, toward some kind of road or help. But in truth, I had no idea if I was going in circles or even heading deeper into the wild backcountry. The monster could be a hundred yards behind me or still prowling miles back at the abandoned tower. There was no telling. Stiff from cold and agony, each step was now a monumental effort of will. Blindly, I blundered over rocks and fallen logs, bruising and lacerating myself further. My head spun with pain and exhaustion. The darkness around me seemed to be closing in, suffocating. Some primal part of me wanted nothing more than to collapse to the ground and surrender to oblivion. 
but I forced that bleak impulse down, dredging up some last reserve of strength. To give in to despair and pain would mean final defeat. So I soldiered on, limping and groping through the blackness. Somewhere there had to be help or refuge. I just had to endure and keep searching. Time lost meaning as I became a creature of pure survival instinct, consumed only by putting one foot in front of the other. A dense fog of pain obscured all else. I nearly stumbled right over the edge of a gully before halting my reckless advance. Teetering there, I swayed, about to black out from exhaustion and suffering. As I lingered on the brink of collapse, the wind changed, carrying the faint scent of wood smoke. I blinked, peering into the darkness. Somewhere ahead, just visible between the trees, was the subtle glow of firelight. Hope flickered back to life within me. Gathering my last amount of energy, I staggered directly toward that beacon in the growing darkness. Minutes or hours later, I limped into a clearing housing a small campsite. Figures moved in surprise around a campfire. I had never seen a more beautiful sight. Hardly believing my luck, I called out hoarsely to the blurred shapes. My voice was weak and rasping after hours without water. As I approached, a man and woman jumped up, staring in alarm at my disheveled, bloody form emerging from the darkness. Help! I croaked before collapsing to my knees. They hesitated, then hurried over to support me. Oh my God, are you okay? The woman asked. She looked about 30, dressed in hiking clothes, her face showing with concern. The man just stared, wide-eyed. What happened to you? He said. You look like you barely survived a bear attack. I shook my head, wincing at the pain in my leg. Not a bear, I gasped. There's something else, some kind of creature out there. The couple exchanged an uneasy glance, clearly doubtful. Here, let's get you warmed up first the woman said gently. They helped me over to sit by the campfire. Its warmth was heavenly after hours spent stumbling and lost in darkness. The man handed me his canteen, and I gulped the water desperately. I'm Katie, by the way, the woman said. This is my husband, Matt. I'm James. Thank you. I thought I was done for out there. Matt examined my mangled leg, his brow creasing. This looks bad. It might be broken. I've got a first aid kit. Let me patch you up. As he wrapped the swollen limb in a tensor bandage, I described the watchtower and the ghastly creature that had pursued me. Katie's eyes widened, but Matt looked skeptical. No offense, man, but that sounds crazy. Maybe you hit your head or got lost and imagined this... thing, he said. I grabbed his arm, meeting his eyes intently. I know what I saw. It was real and it's still out there hunting me. They exchanged another worried look. Just then, a distant howl echoed through the trees, seeming to vibrate the ground itself. Matt and Katie both jumped. The animalistic roar rose and fell again. No natural creature made a sound like that. What the hell was that? Matt said, panicked. Katie turned to me, all doubt gone from her face now. Okay, we believe you. We need to get out of these woods, now. They began quickly packing gear into their backpacks while I gulped more water. As they kicked dirt over the fire, the beast's cries sounded again, closer now. Fear clawed at my gut. With Matt supporting me, we hurried from the campsite toward a nearby dirt road where their truck was parked. My leg blazed with pain, but I pushed on, propelled by terror. Reaching the battered pickup, Matt opened the passenger door and helped me clamber in. The cries were growing steadily louder behind us. Katie threw the packs in the truck bed and leaped into the driver's seat. Tires spun and sent up a rooster tail of gravel as she floored the gas pedal. We swerved onto the road and sped away just as a massively inhuman shape jumped out of the trees behind us. Matt and I stared wide-eyed at each other. The creature's enraged roars faded away as we fled. My head swam with relief. We had made it out. Matt's truck bounced down the dirt road, 
carrying us away from the howls behind us. My body ached and my head swam, but I felt overwhelming relief to be escaping that cursed forest. After driving in shaken silence for a while, Katie spoke up. James, where are you staying? We can take you to the nearest hospital to get checked out. I hesitated. Now that the immediate terror had passed, I just wanted to get home. I couldn't bear trying to explain everything to doctors or police right now. They'd think I was crazy or delusional from injury. I'd rather you just drop me at my hotel if that's okay. I need to clean up and rest. Matt and Katie exchanged a worried glance but didn't argue. We soon reached the outskirts of the small mountain town where I was staying. Pulling into the motel parking lot, Matt helped me hobble to my door. Take care, man. Seriously, go see a doctor, he said. I thanked them for the rescue. Once inside, I collapsed onto the bed, utterly spent. My leg was swollen and caked with dirt and blood from the fall. My arms and face stung with dozens of cuts and abrasions. But somehow, miraculously, no bones seemed broken. With great effort, I limped to the bathroom and cleaned my wounds in the shower. The cuts burned under the hot water and soap, but it felt good to wash off the forest grime. After drying off, I swallowed some painkillers and bandaged the deeper gashes. Though exhausted, I knew sleep would be impossible with my nerves still frayed. I brewed a pot of strong coffee, wanting to stay awake. Settling onto the lumpy mattress, I flipped aimlessly through TV channels, trying to distract my racing mind. But despite my efforts, horrific visions of the creature kept intruding. Its twisted face and white eyes haunted me each time I blinked. I could almost smell its fetid stench and hear its rumbling breath nearby. Somehow I must have dozed off eventually, because I jerked awake, crying out from another nightmare of being pursued through the dark woods. Heart pounding, I fumbled for the bedside lamp. Pale morning light filtered through the curtains. The night had passed uneventfully, though my nerves felt as raw as ever. Over the next few days, paranoia and bad dreams consumed me. I hardly slept, jumping at the smallest creak or thump from neighboring rooms. Though the creature was miles away, I couldn't shake the feeling it was coming for me, tracking my scent. I knew I should tell someone, the police, rangers, anyone, about the thing menacing the woods. But deep down, I understood how absurd it would sound. They'd think the trauma and blood loss had made me imagine the whole ordeal. No one would believe such a nightmarish creature could be real. So I kept silent, staying barricaded in my room. I stopped contacting friends and family, afraid they'd see how unhinged I had become. I avoided other motel guests, making only brief midnight supply runs to the deserted lobby. I knew I couldn't go on living this way, yet saw no way to return to normality. The woods had broken something in me, leaving me a paranoid mess. I spent the next week holed up in my motel room, curtains drawn. The creature's gnarled face haunted my dreams each night, and every creak or car door slam made me flinch certain it was coming for me. My best friend Mark called daily, worried by my sudden silence. Each time I let it go to voicemail, too ashamed to explain my panicked state. But after a week, I finally answered. James, thank God, I've been so worried about you, Mark said. What happened? Where did you go? I hesitated. Sorry, the hiking trip was more intense than I expected. I'm fine just needed some rest. Mark didn't sound convinced. Well, I'm glad you're okay, but you're clearly not fine. Talk to me, man. Really, I'm all right, I lied. My phone died and then I got sick, but I'm feeling better now, just tired. We spoke a while longer before I made an excuse to hang up, promising to call him soon. My chest ached with loneliness and shame, but I couldn't bear to tell anyone what I had experienced. My mom also called repeatedly, demanding to know why I wasn't answering. Each time I fed her the same weak story, promising I'd visit home soon. Though doubtful, she reluctantly accepted my lies, 
making me swear to take care of myself. But I wasn't taking care of myself at all. I hardly ate, stopped shaving, and showered only occasionally. At night, every branch scrape on the window or creak of the floorboards shot adrenaline through my system. Sleep brought only terrors of the creature dragging me back into its lair. I knew my anxiety and seclusion weren't healthy or sustainable. I had to rejoin the world at some point or accept a life consumed by trauma. But even venturing outside to get the mail made my heart race. I remained endlessly vigilant for a hulking shadow stalking me from the trees. Nearly a month after my hiking trip, I finally recognized I had to get help before I self-destructed. I still couldn't tell anyone the full truth, but clearly, I was deeply scarred by something that happened in those woods. I decided to find a therapist and start working through my intense anxiety. I had to stop hiding from life and fight to regain some happiness and normalcy. The creature couldn't take that from me unless I let it. I still double-checked the locks each night and kept a light on. Images of that awful, twisted face sometimes woke me from restless sleep. But slowly, day by day, I was getting better. Letting go of shame, I started reconnecting with friends and family. Though I knew the memories would never leave me completely, I refused to surrender everything to that unspeakable darkness. It's been over 20 years now since that fateful hiking trip. Two decades spent trying to make sense of the horrors I witnessed in those remote Washington woods. Time has dulled the bone-chilling fear I felt back then. But there are still nights when snippets of the ordeal flash through my mind, jolting me awake in a cold sweat. During the first few years afterward, those memories were a constant torment. That twisted, inhuman face stalked my dreams and lingered at the edge of my vision while awake. Simple shadows would conjure images of the creature coming for me. I jumped at every creak and bump, hypervigilant that it had returned to finish what it started. My personality and outlook changed too. Where once I was outgoing and adventurous, I became withdrawn and timid, afraid to leave the safety of home. I pushed away concerned friends and family, unable to articulate what I had experienced. Counseling helped temper the worst anxiety but no therapist truly believed my account of an otherworldly forest monster. I can't blame them. It sounds absurd even to me now. For a long time, anger and shame festered in me over how that single encounter had stolen my health and happiness. I despised the person I had become. Paranoid. Broken. Haunted. At my lowest points, I considered taking my own life just to be free of the endless trauma. That horrific encounter took so much from me for so long, but by moving forward each day with purpose, compassion, and hope, I take back what is most precious, a life lived vibrantly and unafraid. Though the darkness may haunt the far corners, it cannot dim my spirit unless I allow it. After enduring the worst it could inflict, I now know light always remains if we seek it.